The Senior Rehab Project is supported by The Game Changers, a group of motivated rehab clinicians that are crushing mediocrity and advancing care for older adults. You can join this group of people and get access to the private Facebook group, the monthly meetup with article discussions, and have a say in the direction of this movement. Get off the sidelines and get involved. Just go to SeniorRehabProject.com forward slash Game Changers. Hit me! This is a Senior Rehab Podcast, the podcast for rehab clinicians that want to better serve older adults. And now your host, my grandson, Dusty Jones. Hello, folks. This is Dustin Jones, the creator of the Senior Rehab Project, and I'm very excited for you to meet today's guest, Meg Lowry, the physio uh, from Australia. If you are involved with SRP in any way, shape, or form, you you probably recognize this name. Uh, Meg is an all-star clinician, uh, but she's also an app app developer. She created Clock Yourself, which is a really cool app that we can use to train kind of reaction timing, uh, stepping strategies, you know, balance capacity. I mean, the list goes on and on in terms of what you can do uh, with this app. But we talked about kind of her career, uh, what she's up to, her interests, um, and I'm really excited for you to hear a little bit more about her story. Uh, before we jump into the interview, though, uh, Meg is doing something really cool uh, around this time of of the Super Bowl of PT with CSM. Uh, she is trying to help out uh, Patience, who is an aspiring physiotherapist from Bermuda. Uh, Patience has been through a lot; has you know had lots of issues with trying to get into PT school and get the appropriate uh, you know scholarships and funding. And Patience has turned into uh, the global PT community for some for some assistance. And Meg is rallying behind her and offering uh, to give Patience the proceeds of her Clock Yourself app from February 21st to March 7th. Now I'm going to let Meg, uh, you know, talk a little bit more about that. I'm going to play the audio from a video she created, I and mean, I'll put links to all this stuff in the show notes so you can look. Um, further. But this is something really cool. And I want all of us to consider, you know, helping out with this, uh, you know, downloading the app uh, to support Meg because she's been a big supporter of SRP, but then also, you know, being able to support patients. I've got an announcement for the global physiotherapy community. You might have seen a GoFundMe campaign come out of Bermuda. A young student really wants to become a physiotherapist, but she needs to raise funds for her tuition. Now, the time has come to step up our game. So I'm going to donate all profits from the Clock Yourself app downloads for two weeks from the 21st of February to the 7th of March to help fund hashtag Patience the PT. Patience really deserves our help. She was inspired to become a physiotherapist from seeing her sister receive physiotherapy with spina bifida. She had so much red tape and some bad luck to deal with, and it took her five years to be accepted to Sheffield Hallam University in the United Kingdom into a physiotherapy course. And she's so excited to start physio, but Bermuda scholarships were decided before she was offered a place in the course. So Patience now needs to raise the money for her first year of tuition. So she started a GoFundMe campaign, and she's got one third of her tuition funds sorted. And I noticed some seriously big influencers retweeting it as well. But all that retweeting generated very few donations from the global PT community, and I think we can do better. So to incentivize you to donate just a couple of bucks towards this campaign, you can just download the Clock Yourself app. I can go into my app analytics and you can just set the dates to say how many downloads did we have, what did we make. I'll screenshot that. I'll tweet that at Meg Lowry PT is my Twitter and at clock underscore yourself. So people can see that. I'll be really, um, really transparent with it. Thank you very much. I appreciate all of the support that I can get. And this is just amazing. So grateful. So if you're not yet familiar with the Clock Yourself app, basically consider it a reaction time training app to train faster steps in unanticipated directions in the neurogeriatric community. But surprisingly, it's being used in sports, in pediatrics, ortho, all sorts of things because the stepping speed is actually completely adjustable. All the person needs to do is imagine a clock face on the floor around their feet and the app will prompt them to take steps to those numbers. We can all get some value from it and we can help patients, the PT.
every little bit counts, like you said. Fingers crossed. Yeah. <laughs> All right, folks, there you have it. Download the Clock Yourself app from now, the 21st of February through March 7th, and support patients in becoming a physiotherapist. Uh, also, for those that are going to be at CSM, uh, come say say hi to me or Aaron or Tali, and Meg's going to be there as well at any of the sessions that we'll be attending. Uh, to find out where we're going to be, just go to seniorrehabproject.com forward slash CSM. It's always real encouraging to meet people uh, in person and just know, you know, just kind of see the faces behind some of the listeners and the people we interact with, uh, especially in the Facebook group. Uh, we're really excited about CSM this year. Uh, that site, the senioriaproject.com forward slash CSM also has all the information uh, for you to be able to track along. So you don't miss out on a lot of the helpful content, uh, using the hashtag APTA CSM and hashtag old not week CSM. Uh, hashtag town hall CS and we have these different hashtags that you can follow along on Instagram on Twitter or Facebook uh, just to see kind of what's going on we're going to do our best to give you uh, pretty comprehensive coverage we're going to be recording a lot of live video uh, that you can check out on Facebook and you know if it turns out pretty good we're going to make that into a podcast uh, later on so check that out links to all of these things will be in the show notes without further ado let's get into this interview with the clinician on a mission Meg Lowry Hello, friends. Welcome to the Senior Rehab Podcast. Today's episode is the Wanda from Down Under, Meg Lowry. How are we doing? I'm great, Dustin. Thanks for having me on. Can I call you that? The Wanda from <laughs> Down Under? Sure, you can. Go for it. <laughs> <laughs> so for, for those that don't know Meg, uh, if you're in the Facebook group, the Senior Rehab Project Facebook group, you definitely know her, but she's a clinician on a mission to empower older adults to shape their course of aging. She's also an app developer, an author, a business owner, and I'm sure you wear several other hats that you're too humble to tell us. Um, But I'm very excited to get to talk with you. You're one of those people that, you know, we've never talked before, but I feel like I know you. Yeah. And we could have a beer and talk for hours, uh, you know, just geeking out about all this stuff. So this is pretty cool for me. We have interacted a lot in social media land, so that's been yeah, it's great. Yeah, the internet's a crazy thing. So I guess we'll get started off. I want to start with uh, a guest or a, a listener question. So Troy Mead, he is in the Facebook group. He asked you, "Where did you get your passion to work with the population of patients that you work with?" And I think anyone that's interacted with you online uh, it, it is very evident and comes through very quickly uh, just how passionate you are about your work. But where where did that come from? Um, I think I'm, I've always been a bit of an activist, a bit of a social justice warrior. Um, Mm. and so I like to work, uh, with people or for people who I sort of consider to be underrepresented or underserved in some way. And, um, so when I went into physio, I actually thought I'd work in pediatrics. That's what I thought I'd, I'd like to do. But the more I learned about older people and the more I realized that they weren't really receiving the best services and weren't being assessed and treated as well as they could be. Um, I think I was just drawn to, um, drawn into working with that population of people and I didn't look Mm. back. I don't regret it. Love it. Was there an influential professor or a particular person that you can think of that, that was pretty influential in that? Um, probably not so much at university. Um, I didn't, I found them uh, the, the the topics that we studied on older adults complex and fascinating, but I still think when I first graduated at that point, I wasn't really interested in geriatric or neurophysio all that much. It was once I started working in my new graduate role at Ipswich Hospital, and I had um, a rotation in a in a really good rehab unit, a st- probably the best stroke unit I've ever, I've ever seen, and I've assessed mm. um, a lot of people in different stroke units, and it was probably a physician there, Doctor. Um, Dr. David Douglas, who held the allied health professionals to account, who really pushed us hard to um, achieve goals with our clients and just facilitated case conferences really well. And it just made me want to work hard for my clients, to please them, to please him, to, you know, it was just, he was so well-rounded in the way that he set goals for us and, and, and Mm. structured our rehab programs. And I think I admired him professionally. And so I was just drawn to it but it was just a I think it's also just the first few clients you get you know the first the first um, person who's a stroke survivor that you see if if that's a positive experience for you then you're more likely to approach 
the next one more positively. And I think I just had a really good run of great, great patience in that rotation. Yeah, that, that can be a game changer. Uh, I, I specifically remember uh, my first rotation. I never, you know, worked in a rehab hospital, but just, you know, did a clinical there. And the impact that one can have when you start to work with someone that can't even, you know, speak or sit up on their own. And by Mm -hmm. the time that they're, excuse me, they're leaving, you know, they're, they're ambulating and just how powerful that can be from the, you know, just the the clinician standpoint. When you it work really is. <laughs> it's different with the neurodegenerative conditions. You know, I find them mm-hmm. um, rewarding to work with and I like to work with Parkinson's and I like to work with dementia. But at the end of the day, um, you know that even though you can get some small gains with those people in the long term, that, that it's a downwards decline. And it's, um, I think it's a, a bit more challenging to work with those clients, but they're people that I'm still drawn to as well. So... Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think also probably the other thing that maybe Troy was probably inferring is also, you know, I, I do a lot of work with people um, with cognitive impairment and maybe part of that is that I have had, you know, I had I've, I've typically a lot of us have had a, a grandparent who had Alzheimer's disease. I certainly did. Um, and that was, that was hard to watch as a small child, um, seeing my great-grandfather lose his lose his English and revert back to German and and not be able to express himself. Um, And then as an adult, I was working in an aged care assessment team and um, I also had a friend who was an older Rotarian. Do you guys have Rotary in the USA? Of course you do. You have Rotary. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I should know that because I was a Rotary exchange student um, when I was 16 and my Um. Um, my host family also had an older Rotarian staying with them from Australia and we spent about three, uh, about, I don't know, three weeks together living in the same home and I became friends with this man, Briar. Um, and then years later, um, I met up with him when I moved to Brisbane, we became friends, we'd have coffee dates, etc. And then he started to deteriorate cognitively and he, um, he had pretty, pretty severe Alzheimer's disease and would, you know, answer the, answer the door naked. Um, and you know, one time, (laughs) one time like dropped him off at his house and he couldn't, he, I realized he had no lights working in his home because he didn't know how to change his light bulbs and things like that. So I, um, yeah, that was hard to, hard to see a man who had such, he was so distinguished and he was so intelligent. It was a great photographer and to see him, um, sort of lose his dignity in some ways I think um that was that was something I was really drawn to to help him and um I ended up becoming his power of attorney I applied to the Australian government to to take care of him and become his power of attorney and um put him into an aged care facility and and help to feed him each day after work and that sort of thing that didn't go on for that long only sort of 11 months um but yeah, I think when you have those personal stories, when you see somebody who's who's lived a great life, and then all of a sudden things come crashing down around them when they get older, it's something that you just want to be there to pick up the pieces. So it's great we can yeah. make a job out of it, isn't it? Yeah, it is pretty incredible. I know a lot of listeners are thinking in their head of their own stories because um, yeah. yeah, we all have them. So so what does a day look like now? So I'm I'm trying to. <laughs> piece everything together in terms of what you do. Uh, but yeah, just lay out like a normal day. Oh, man. For Meg. I, mean, I don't have any normal day anymore. <laughs> um, my days are long, that's for sure. My, my work, when I set up my practice, my goal was to do about one third rehab. So in the home, home visiting, which you guys call home health, we call community yeah. rehab. Um, one third prehab which doesn't really exist, but I'm just working on it. Um, and so I do a lot of group, a group exercise classes, a lot of take on an educator role and I'm a facilitator of, of healthy aging exercise classes. And I do about 15 hours of those a week now. Mm. They're great. Right. Um, and then one third innovation, um, which I thought maybe I could have a local influence with my, with my prehab work an individual influence with my rehab work. And then maybe, a, maybe a national or global influence with my, innovation work so I have all of those balls up in the air all the time um but at the moment I'm just really really busy with a lot of referrals so um I'm sort of working say 
this morning I started 6.15 a.m., <laughs> okay, um, my mm-hmm. first client. He's a, a, a gentleman in his, I, he, just, he just turned 60 actually. Uh, he's recovering from back surgery. Um, he's very overweight. He's very deconditioned, but he's really positive about um, changing his life. And so um, I just, I'm now facilitating sort of cardio and strength training with him, which is awesome, and getting him into my, uh, my group classes as well. He's just started those. So I saw him this morning and then I drove 45 minutes to um, to the coast and got on a vehicle barge and went across to Maclay Island. Remember I posted that photo recently of um, yeah. like a, an island that I've been visiting. So um, it was actually a different island. I'm visiting two islands at the moment. So two different oh, that it's yeah i'm i can't believe i get paid to do this but so i got on the vehicle barge and um that's like a 30 minute journey and then i went and drove my car to the home of a a man who survived a stroke and i um did his last assessment today actually so the end of a 12-week program that was funded by the federal government um to help to transition him from hospital back into the home so we um, reassessed his outcome measures and said our goodbyes and all the rest um and then i did another three home visits and then ran two classes this evening and so i got home actually 8 30 p.m had a shower oh. and um, had some dinner and then set up to talk to you, mate. So it's been a long <laughs> day because <laughs> it's now well, like 10.30 at night in Australia. Oh, that's, that's impressive. So I think <laughs> from the American standpoint, you know, we always, I feel like we complain a lot about barriers to be able to do things we want to do. Um, and w- what makes me think of that is your prehab classes, the group classes. Mm-hmm. Is that, I'm just thinking like, man, that's awesome. How, like, what's the system like there? Is that something that these people are paying out of pocket for or the government is is supporting that as well as the home business? Everyone is out of pocket to some extent, some completely out of pocket, like some pay 100% of their fee and some people um, get back, say, a half to three quarters of it from the government. I run a... um, Oh, sorry, not really from the government, from their private health insurer. So we probably should go through how health insurance works in Australia. <laughs> hey? um, okay, so here we have got a Medicare system. So the federal government covers um, sort of essential, health, most essential health services, not dentistry. Um, so surgeries that are really needed, any emergency surgeries, you know, you're never going to be uh, losing a limb and then being asked to pay at emergency before you have your surgery. That wouldn't happen. So every, all the major stuff is paid for. Um, the government pays for a, a lot of our visits to our GPs, but sometimes there's a little bit of a gap, like $7 for some GPs and maybe up to $20. Um, but for things like physiotherapy, um, there are programs that the government funds, like the 12-week transition care program that I mentioned that's sending me out to this island to see um, the stroke survivor. Um, but not every single person is entitled to those. It really comes down to whether they have rehab potential and whether they meet certain criteria for those programs. Um, the government is otherwise uh, not providing a whole heap for in terms of funding allied health. Um, people with chronic disease can get five subsidised visits a year to an allied health professional, but it doesn't really subsidise the full cost of the appointment. A lot of us um, probably should be charging a gap but don't because we're kind, but it doesn't really <laughs> it doesn't really cover what it should cover. Um, yeah. Otherwise, so individuals, about half of the people in this country have um, private health insurance. And that's not covered by our, our employer or anything like that. It's just um, private providers that we we pay out of pocket for every fortnight to, um, you know, we might pay, well, I don't know, $70 a fortnight or something pretty ridiculous like that to um, be covered by these schemes. And then the concept is that they will, they will cover our... Um, our additional health needs. So if we want to go to a private hospital, if we don't want to wait for a knee replacement or a hip hip replacement, we'll be able to go in and have these surgeries. But to be honest, they're still quite often out of pocket an extraordinary amount. Um, And for physiotherapy, you might, if you get a home visit with me, so I would charge um, say $110 to do a home visit, they might get back 
$35 from their private health insurance. So mm. that's how it works for a home visit. And then for group classes, um, they, if say they, I pay charge $15 for a class um, and they have to book like eight classes. So it's a program, not just a drop in sort of system. They might get back um, $10 from their private health insurer up to a certain amount. And after they've reached that cap, like $300 paid back a year on physio, that's it. They get no extra. So it's not necessarily the best system. Are you filling out the paperwork to send to the, the insurance for them to get reimbursed or the patients? Oh, sorry. Hang on. I actually just muted my computer then and um, because I had a beep sound and then I <laughs> muted you as well. My bad. Can you go again? Um, do, are you filling out a lot of that uh, paperwork or documentation for them to get reimbursed or are the patients doing that? The patient does it and there is very okay. little documentation required. So like I see what you guys are dealing with, with like the Oasis. I've seen it and I still always have my little laugh on, under my breath because <laughs> Oasis means something different to us. Um, <laughs> well, us it's, you, can, you can say, what is um, Oasis? Oasis, well, in women's health, it stands for obstetric anal sphincter injury. <laughs> That's so how it feels thinking about Oasis. <laughs> Yeah, I bet it is. A real pain in the butt. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I can see. I actually asked Jamie Lowy to send me um, some info about the Oasis like a year ago just to see what it was that you guys were all talking about. And I looked at it yeah. for like 20 seconds went, oh, I'm glad that's your problem and not mine. <laughs> um, oh, it's it's awesome, to be honest. It's, it's maybe not... It's maybe too good a system in terms of um, there's very little onus on us to show documentation to private health insurers. So we have standards that are set by our professions and in our registration bodies that we have to document what we do, but we don't have pro formas of to, um, exactly what we have to document on or what we have to report on. And basically, um, if a person comes and sees us, they don't necessarily need a referral. They can just see us as first contact practitioners in Australia. And then they just have a, an insurance card and we swipe it and the insurer knows that um, that they've seen a registered physiotherapist and they just basically pay that money back into the person's account straight mm. away. Um, like, and we do not have to send anything to the insurer unless they audit us, which never happens. Like it does happen occasionally, but like pretty much never. So um, okay. when, when they audit us, they don't really, as long as we've written something reasonable like soap notes, that's fine. Mm -hmm. So you're saying you spend more time treating people than typing on a computer? Absolutely. I don't type on computers throughout the day. <laughs> oh, um, my gosh. I'm just, I record you, my you, notes with a voice recorder because I don't have a template I have to fill out. So I just record it all sort of um, verbatim on a voice recorder yeah. and then transfer it um, at the end of the day or at the end of the week sometimes if I'm a little bit slack, admittedly. That's um, beautiful. So, so one of the aspects of your work is the group fitness. So the, the prehabilitation, you've got a, a shirt that says prehabilitation is a wise move. <laughs> when you are talking to your patients or you're pitching this service, mm. how do you define prehabilitation? Um, I just tell them that it's um, preparation for um, older age to basically prevent problems from occurring or to nip problems in the bud. Um, so sort of um, prehabilitation is what you do if you never want to require rehabilitation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we focus on, um, I talk to them about the, the natural, I guess, some of the pre-wired um, decline that you can experience in the body and the brain over the course of the lifetime and how some of that is not hardwired. It's pre-wired but not hardwired and you can actually um, mitigate that decline. You can um, take control of the course of your aging with um, strategic exercise and prehabilitation is a program of strategic exercise to uh, optimize your course of aging. Yeah. Hmm. I like that concept because when in the American context, when we use that word prehab, it's almost always associated with um, some type of physical therapy treatment prior to a scheduled surgery. So yeah. whether it's yeah, like a knee replacement yeah, or hip replacement or something along those lines and people, yeah. you know, will do a course of, you know, four to six weeks or whatever. Um, but I, I like how you frame it to, to where it's going to prevent rehabilitation. I feel like when we 
speak in those terms. We don't use the term prehab, but we'll just use the term fitness or wellness yeah. or something along those lines. But I think yeah. your the the prehab term really speaks to our our unique skill set and and perspective. I like that. Yeah, that's right. Is it's that not just general, it's not just general exercise, is it? It's it's strategic yeah. exercise, and it's it's still individualized to the person, and and there's subtle impairments that you can identify through an assessment. Um, it's not common, no. Prehabs, um, again, probably people here might even think of prehab as being like um, something that's initiated at a pre-admission clinic prior to an orthopedic surgery. I guess um, I just I just embraced the buzzword and and um, because I think it really speaks to people and and I target baby boomers, like they're the population that I that I work with um, the most in my group kind of work. And a lot of these baby boomers have older adult. Um, parents who they have seen through a course of rehabilitation. So I think it speaks to them. Um, I think it, yeah, it's a very um, provocative word, I think, to them. And it gets them thinking, oh, wow, this is something different to just general exercise. Right, right. I think a lot of light bulbs are going off in listeners' heads right now, (laughs) at least for me, uh, just in thinking of how to reach uh, people and kind of set ourselves apart from, um, yeah, just other people doing, you know, group based classes. Um, so I think one part or one thing that that you're definitely known for definitely in the senior rehab project circle is your, um, implementation of, of cognitive, uh, activities while performing other tasks. And that is very, you know, with your app, with your book. Um, so I guess I want to, I'll just ask you Nicole Nexon's question. She said, how, how did you create the Clock Yourself app and what, what made you decide to create an app versus another form of media? I was naive, Nicole. <laughs> I was so naive. <laughs> if I had known then what I know now, I wouldn't have done it. And that's probably the beauty of naivety. Um, <laughs> it's probably a good thing that I went in blind. Um, I gradually started to make the Clock Yourself app um, with a friend because I actually thought it would be easier than what I was doing with that exercise. So that was an exercise that I, uh, so Clock Yourself is about um, stepping and weight shifting on an imaginary clock face on the floor and um, the the app prompts the person to step to different numbers on the clock face and then it randomizes those numbers and it, you can change the stepping speed from like 10 steps per minute, so Parkinson's slow to super agile athlete fast. Um, and it's got a bunch of brain games embedded in it. So that's just the backstory to people who want to know what that's about. Um, I, I've been playing those um, those games with my clients, embedding brain games into the exercises for a long time. And I had been, um, sometimes I'd see somebody who wasn't that interested in general exercise, who wasn't very compliant, but enjoyed the cognitive challenge of clock yourself. And so, which was never called clock yourself. It was just clock stepping exercises. Um, and so I would record my voice on their phone and um, at the pace that they were stepping, right? Just like I would just watch them do it and I just press record while I was giving them these random prompts and then they would take it home and practice it for you know three or four minutes at home um, each day and then they'd come back a week later and ask me can it, can you make it faster because that's too slow now and I didn't have anything to document to say what speed it was like I didn't mm-hmm. know how fast they were stepping um, I was just writing faster again faster again you know and I thought well yeah this is a bit time consuming. If I could just have this automated, <laughs> this would be easy. So I then like recorded my voice on my iPhone to a metronome. I played a metronome in my, on a headset and just recorded these numbers over and over um, at different speeds. And then people would say, oh, can you Bluetooth that to my phone? And I'm gonna, I, I gave it to my grandson and he really enjoyed it and blah, blah, blah. So I asked a mate of mine if he could um, just put – if he could just record 12 numbers on his fo- on an app and then like basically randomize them and change the speed of them. And he said, yes, that's, that's where, that's what we first committed to. And then it yeah. just got out of control with different ideas, like so many different ideas that came from clients that were enthusiastic about it, that came from, you know, the more I thought about it and the more like, I don't know, professional development I'd go to. And I saw mm-hmm. Todd Sampson speak. Do you know Todd Sampson, Dustin? I do not. Oh, he's a Canadian guy. He lives in Australia and he um 
he has this program on TV called like Hack Your Brain. Um, mm. And he, it's all about exploiting neuroplasticity. And he actually spoke at our, the equivalent of CSM for us is APA conference. Um, and he mm. spoke at that conference about um, how we should do more to um, to develop neuroplasticity and to push the envelope of neuroplasticity with our with our exercises and um, embed memory and all these different tasks into them. And he gave a great case for it. And I was just like, oh, I, it's nothing that I hadn't heard before, but I heard it at the right time because I was developing that simple little app with Dave, which I wasn't even probably going to put on the app stores. So I was just going to use it in my clinic. Um, and then I was like, Hey Dave, I've got this great idea. We need to put months of the year and we need to put abstract symbols oh. and we need to put doubled numbers and we need to, you know, and he was like, whoa, 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 whoa. This is going to cost a lot more money, a lot more time. I was like, yeah, let's do it. <laughs> so, <laughs> but it had to be an app, um, for yeah. Nicole. Like I would have done it. I would say to anybody else, some, I get asked a lot, Oh, you know, how do you make an app and, and should, you know, should I make an app? And I would sort of say, look, if it's, if you can make that into an ebook, or if you can make that onto a web-based app, or if you can do anything else besides making a native phone app, do it. If there's any other way of transmitting that information besides an app, do it because apps are really complex machines. Um, yeah. Just they're a horrible beast to to code. Mm. And I feel like as soon as you get it where you want it, then you have to change it with every update, don't you? Not not so much like iOS and is pretty smart with the way that they do their updates. So usually you don't have to change it. But I mean, certainly when they when they bring out something really new, um, they'll say, "Oh, do you want to make your app ready for or responsive to the um, the Apple Watch or whatever?" And I'm like, "No, no, no, don't <laughs> don't give me any more headaches, please. It's expensive and it's just hard work." But the Android stuff is a little bit harder because there's so many different screen sizes of all these devices. So at least with Apple, they, they standardize the screen size, but clock yourselves on both Android and Apple. So we get a bit more, we have a few more headaches with keeping it up to date with Android. Yeah. Yeah. And I'll, I'll put a link in the show notes uh, for everyone listening to the clock yourself app, but it is, it is pretty amazing and it's very helpful and easy to use. Uh, I know Meg has done a lot of uh, feedback from, patients and clinicians and, you know, made adjustments based on that uh, just to make it very easy to use. So especially, I mean, even in, in the home health setting, I've really enjoyed, you know, using it with my patients and they enjoy it too, because it, it just breaks away from the norm of just kind of the boring, you know, exercise routine that you've got a very creative way to, you know, gamify it, if you will. And I yeah, think that's gamification. It's probably no nothing I do is normal, <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah, no, I, it's a great it's a great way to get adherence from some people. It's just one tool. It's not the be all and end all. You know, it's just another thing right. to have in our toolkits, and it's a hell of a lot simpler than using Nintendo We Have. You know, that's just not a practical as great as We Have has been in in research studies for balance and prevention of falls. It's just not practical. Like you can't carry one of those Nintendo consoles under your arm when you knock on someone's door and. <laughs> I mean, even when I was um, an outpatient rehab senior at a hospital, I didn't, I had Nintendo there and I probably used it like once the whole year because it just takes time to set up and calibrate. And so, yeah, to me, Clock Yourself was was just a more sensible, convenient solution. But um, yeah, there's some sacrifices with it. You don't have feedback with Clock Yourself, for example, whereas with with Nintendo We Have or, or Xbox Connect, you'd have a sensor on each ankle or in their hand or something like that. And it would take a while to calibrate, but then they'd have feedback on the screen, you know? So it's sort of, you've got to weigh up how much value that feedback is to that person. If their cognitive processing speeds quick enough to catch that feedback and do anything uh, reasonable with it in that time. Um, I decided it wasn't, but uh, for most people, but yeah, I think it's, I think it's a good tool. It's certainly become like my world, Dustin, but I don't think it's, I don't um, want anyone to think that just because I talk about it a lot that I think it's, you know, the answer to every single patient's problem. It's not. Right, right, right. I, but but I do feel like it's it's applicable to so many of our patients, the overwhelming majority. Yeah, um, yeah. For sure. And I, I get that ad advice. Um, I get a lot of advice from like well-meaning um, entrepreneurs and, and business people um, and I'm, I just probably don't take time to listen to it um, as much as I should. But 
the one thing that I keep hearing is that it's too broad, it's too applicable. Like it's, I've made this um, tool deliberately broad so that it's useful for sports and agility work and it's useful for um, brain injury and stroke and Parkinson's and just low impact exercise for arthritis or whatever. So I've, I've made it really, really applicable to everybody, but then it doesn't speak to any one person. So in terms of marketing it, it's not like, um, you know, normally people like, look at, I don't know about what you've got in the U S but we've got a Panadol, which is like a paracetamol, like acetaminophen for you guys. And, um, the, the greatest selling Panadol is Panadol osteo because it's for people with arthritis. It's the same damn thing, right? It's the same, it's the same thing. But if you say this is Panadol for arthritis, everyone gets it. So I've got this clock yourself. And what I'm keep hearing is this needs to be clock yourself for stroke. This needs to be clock yourself for Parkinson's. This needs to be clock Mm. yourself for sports. You know, we don't want to, no athlete wants to turn on clock yourself and read about, fear of falling and you know which Mm. which which shoes to wear you know that kind of stuff like I need to maybe make it a bit more um focused on one population or another but I I can't choose I can't yeah (laughs) I haven't gone that far down the track maybe after the research is done and we've had more focus groups on it and yeah, yeah we can then work out how to better tailor it to different populations with different versions of it I don't know man yeah that and that could just open up a whole nother yeah, just case of worms with, you know, developing all kinds of different apps, with different branding and whatnot. That, totally, totally. Yeah, that's, <laughs> so for it's a headache. Yeah, for, for people listening that are um, not sold on adding some kind of cognitive component to what they're doing already, kind of give us the, the why and, and the evidence behind, you know, at least the app that, that you've developed. Oh yeah, right. Totally. There's so much there. I think um, I think we probably don't really appreciate how much cognition influences gait, balance, and falls in particular. Um, there is so many great great articles, and I can send you a bunch of them for the show for the show notes. I don't want to just make up statistics um, off the top of my head with all of them, but. There are so many great articles that show that um, people who have slow cognitive processing speed um, have greater variability in their in their gait patterns and um, more risk of falling. Um, I think remember that one of our game changers, um, one of our game changers journal club things for lack of a better word that we did when we all read an article um and I wasn't able to attend that one I just watched it afterwards um Mm -hmm. was about how slow cognitive cognitive processing speed is the best predictor for falls um more than balance more than uh, someone's ability to do tandem stance or single leg stance or the berg or the tug it's actually cognitive processing speed that um, influences their their risk of falls the most and it's actually a um a reversible trait so it's something that we can we can train it's trainable it's changeable and there is good science as to what changes cognitive processing speed in older adults and that at the moment looks to be favoring extra gaming um, so there was a systematic review and meta-analysis performed in 2016 by Akubo, Schoener and Lord and this is one I always have on the top of my head because it, it really spoke to me um, mm. Basically, they looked at all of the um, existing good quality RCTs that um, involved training the stepping strategy. Okay, so, you know, ankle strategy, hip strategy, stepping strategy, you guys familiar with those terms? Yeah, like you all learn the same thing. Okay, great. So they looked at um, which exercise intervention specifically trained the stepping strategy as opposed to the ankle or hip strategy. And so they looked at perturbation training, so putting people in harnesses and tripping them up or pushing them over, um, which sounds like anxiety <laughs> driving but kind of cool research, not so much applicable to what we do in, in home health. Um, mm. And also then trials that I did fast steps in unanticipated directions. And I think all but one of those trials were exergames. So that means um, exercise-based um, gaming, uh, digital gaming consoles like Nintendo or Xbox or Dance Dance Revolution. Um, and so they pulled that data together and they found that together um, 
the reduction in falls rates from those intervention studies was 49% in older fallers. And so if we want to compare that to our systematic review and meta-analysis by Kathy Sherrington, which is the one that everybody seems to hang their hat on, and, and, and for good reason, like there's a lot of value in that systematic review that she updates every few years. But if we look at the best outcomes so far from, um, from so many RCTs on intense balance training is that we're achieving a 39% reduction in falls rates. Otago mm-hmm. achieves, I think, 38% reduction in falls rates. And the duration of those interventions is astronomical. Like they say 50 hours cumulative before you actually get a, a, a change in um, in falls risk, which was a, a great um, shorts episode that Joe, Joe Daniels did. I remember he sort of summed that up really well. So if we look then at... Um, putting those two interventions side by side and no one really has in an RCT put them side by side, balance training versus stepping strategy training. But if we just compare the two systematic reviews, um, the stepping strategy training with a 49% reduction in falls rates to me um, with a a shorter duration of intervention by like, you know, (laughs) by months, um, to me that makes sense that we should be pursuing that. Um, And if you look at those RCTs, uh, a number of them showed improvements in um, executive functioning so um, the prefrontal cortex of the brain and decision making planning um, spatial planning and that sort of stuff and um, cognitive processing speed as tested by the trail making test and choice stepping reaction time Um, so the speed at which they can make a decision and take a step um, and all of those things actually improve and even like a finger tapping reaction was faster in people who had trained exa games w- without using their hands. So they'd trained fast steps, but they were able to, t- to, to tap their finger faster to a response, which shows a change in central processing speed. Um, so, That's yeah, does that, does that all make sense? Like, is that, yeah, is that a good it does. Yeah, and, I think it's pretty exciting. And you had exciting. this amazing graph, too, on, on the Clock Yourself website. So if people, I, I'll put a link to this, but if you go to the bottom of the homepage, you can click on the research. And Meg has created this amazing infograph that just kind of lays uh, all the pathways out and and has this huge list of all the evidence to support um, what she's doing. But it is fascinating and it makes me think of how, you know, little that's being done. But then you mentioned a, a good point in terms of the, I guess, the safety of it, especially with, you know, the perturbation training and and tripping that, you know, like yeah. someone like home health, that's going to be, you know, rather difficult, but when in using your app, um, with some of my patients that, that require some type of assistance or guarding. So if you have someone that, you know, say is like, you know, they're, they're using, you know, some type of Walker, uh, if they're going to be stepping like this, you know, potentially unsupported, you know, you're going to have a hold of them. It, when you do, that, you know, this type of activity with those types of patients, are you more keen to use like a gate belt or have them be able to hold on to something like a walker or uh, a kitchen sink or something like that? How, how do you kind of view uh, an appropriate amount of, of assistance to keep them safe, but then allow them to also be challenged uh, yeah, as well? It's, it's tricky, isn't it? Um, okay. So first of all, like my first approach with someone might be just to, introduce them to um, the idea of randomized prompts and um, Mm -hmm. the idea of sort of responding quickly to a prompt by doing a sit to stand version of clock yourself. So I would play the numbers and tell them to step uh, to stand up on numbers three, nine and five or whatever, you know what I mean? And so there, there, I I would get the leg strength up that way. You don't have to, it doesn't have to be based on a clock face. It's all audio. Mm -hmm. They don't really need to look at the screen. So I get them um, familiar with the concept of um, pay attention to the prompts. When you hear the right prompt, you perform a certain action. And I do that with sit to stand initially for those whose legs are particularly weak. And then for those with, um, you know, with balance and coordination, stepping deficits, um, I then work on a half clock face. So I'm not sure if you've explored that, but in the options, uh, it's in the intro when you first open up the app and then it kind of disappears into the menu. You might not find it again, but um, in the options for every every single level, you can change from a, a full clock face to a half clock face. So we might just do the right half of the clock and they're holding on to the kitchen kitchen counter with their left hand. 
and they'll step okay. to 12, 1, 2, 3, around to number 6. Um, and then we'll turn them around and they'll hold on to the kitchen counter with the right hand and step to numbers um, 6 to 12 the other way, so 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. Um, they can do the the bottom half of the clock and hold both hands onto the kitchen sink if required. So there's a video of a man um, who's a stroke survivor actually doing that and these Willy Walkers next to him and he's holding onto the kitchen sink. Um, that's in the the kind of animated video on the website. Um so yeah, I, I use a half clock face clock faces until until they're ready to um to float their hands above the kitchen sink and then and then move into a full clock face. And then yeah, sometimes I use a gate a gate belt depending on how sort of unpredictable they are. Um mm-hmm. I tend to not use clock yourself with my in my first visit with anyone. Like it right. tends not to be like the first thing that you you throw them into. It's quite it's something that you want to work up to. It's a little bit overwhelming sometimes. Um, so it's absolutely worthwhile doing. Like I can't, I can't stress to you enough, like how important it is to work on cognitive processing speed and on, on choice stepping reaction time. But it just takes a little bit of rapport with that person. And then you get to also know, um, know their movement and know how much you can trust their movement to be safe in the, in that kind of an exercise. Um, but the, the studies on similar EXA games, so this this EXA game will be trialled next year but has not yet been trialled, but the, the studies that I based it on with the same types of steps, forwards, backwards, sideways, diagonal steps, were proven to be safe um, for unsupervised practice with community-dwelling older adults. I guess it just really comes down to uh, and older adults who had a history of falls, but it comes down to picking the right person and educating them about safety first, yeah. Mm. That's awesome. I think the big, the big thing that's really encouraging, I know for me from the home health standpoint, and I know many listeners uh, as well, is that this is scalable, that there's so many factors that we can change to make it appropriate for that person in front of us. Um, that, that makes, I think the app and what you're doing just very uh, useful for almost everyone that, that is working in physical therapy, but definitely listening to this podcast. So Thanks. that's, yeah, that's, exactly. yeah, I really, I'm glad you yeah, see good that. work made scalable it really is scalable cognitively in terms of the cognitive challenge like mm-hmm. the cognitive challenge is higher than anything that mm-hmm. i could probably do myself like in terms of what i you could max it out at being something that would be like suitable for people who are like mensa geniuses you know mm-hmm. in terms of all the different clock faces that you can that you can scramble together and the different languages that you can study them in um and then the physical agility can be athletic level or literally no, um, really Walker Parkinson's slow. So yeah. like I said, that, that, that makes it not necessarily the most marketable product at this stage, but it, mm-hmm. it's great for research now at the moment, because it's going to be researched in heaps of different things, <laughs> random stuff that I didn't intend for it to be researched. In, like, <laughs> random. Like I got this, this guy from Glasgow <laughs> emailed me. Um, he's a musculoskeletal researcher. I think he's a podiatrist, but I don't know. He's an MSK mm-hmm. researcher, postdoc, and he wants to use it in um, juvenile arthritis, <laughs> like a whole PhD <laughs> project at their university, university of, I don't know, something in Glasgow. He's like, do All we right. have your <laughs> I'm like, sure, mate. Like, if that's what you want, <laughs> go for gold. Go right I'm like, ahead. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, I'm not involved in it. It's, you know, it yeah. would be a conflict of interest if I was really directly involved in every research project anyway. So we we'll just, yeah. I, I hope, I hope that he knows what he's doing because I did not build it for that <laughs> population, but I guess it's got the weight shift and mm-hmm. I guess a bit of a cognitive distraction from the pain of weight, of weight bearing. So maybe yeah, it'll work yeah. for that. Fingers crossed. <laughs> That's cool. I, and that, you know, I, I think I mean, we mentioned scalability. Um, I really view this in the same light as, as like strength training, for example, you know, like a, a very common theme, at least on this podcast and in the the Facebook group, you know, is things that, that are pretty common in society that we see with athletes or high level individuals that, that can be scaled and adjusted appropriately, you know, to that patient in front of us, you know, we can take uh, you know, overhead barbell squat and scale that to the, you know, 92 yeah. year old that can, you know, hardly get off the toilet. And you mm-hmm. can take these very high level cognitive challenges that we, you know, often see in high level athletes that we can scale it to that patient in front of us that's struggling, you know, to, to just walk without a cane, you know, so I, I really love just the concept of scalability and how it, it, it really expands across so many 
domains. And I feel like the more that we can have that kind of perspective where we see some of these different types of training techniques or uh, especially I think in the fitness world, I really look to the fitness world to Mm. say like, okay, like this is working with these really high level performers. How can we scale that to, you know, the people, people in front of us. And it's very intriguing to me. And I feel like you're, you're doing that as well on the cognitive side of things. Yeah. And it's inclusive then, isn't it? Like it's, it doesn't, it, it gets rid of that us and them divide that stigma of mm-hmm. what is fall prevention. Like when does clock yourself become um, less about fall prevention and more about dementia prevention or more about, you know, cognitive stimulation or agility. Like there is no, there is no like level that is just for seniors or a level that is just for, for, for stroke survivors or whatever, you know, and then, mm-hmm. I think that's I think that's important to me to have this sort of non ageist language and and um, just to provide a product that is fit for purpose but but scalable to different different people so that they don't feel like they're using a different tool to everybody else. They can grandma can still use the same tool that um, that Olympians use, you know. Right. So yeah, I, I, did, like I never told you this, but I I like to trail run and. Where where I live, the trails are very rock, uh, rocky and rooty, and, and you it's not a lot of running. It's more like shuffling <laughs> and yeah. trying to not trip and fall flat on your face. Mm-hmm. Um, I use your app because you got to just be able to shift and and just change the position of your feet very quickly uh, yeah. to the point of where you know, I've almost fallen several times and just gotten mm. really hurt. I was like, man, I need to improve my reaction time. Yeah. and your app was <laughs> was what I used, so it, it did is. Did you do it on a Bosu, or did you do it on the flat? I, I just did it on the flat. Oh, get on um, it on a Bosu. That's that's fully really oh cool because it kind of <laughs> throw, you know because a Bosu is not it's not a true perturbation, but it does create some element of surprise. You're not 100 percent sure which way it's going to throw you off when you step off it. You know, when you shift your weight, it kind of pushes you in a direction that you don't 100 percent anticipate. So. Yeah. Yeah, I, I like to do it on a Bosu. I, I know a lot of like rehab um, sports physios here train ACL, hamstrings, um, like rehab on the Bosu and ankle rehab on the Bosu with Clock Yourself. So, yeah, give that a go. Yeah. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> uh, I won't be posting a video of that. I'll wait till you should. I don't fall. <laughs> you know, That's Justin, awesome. there, was a, there was a student in your group in the senior rehab project group. And she contacted me saying um, that she was using it to train, no, to to memorize the uh, cranial nerves. Really? You know how there's like 12 cranial nerves? So she was like, yeah, it would start out really slow and then it'll say, I don't know, five and you have to go, she would have to say trigeminal. It's, <laughs> it's number five trigeminal, I'm not even sure, probably. So, yeah. yeah <laughs> yeah, and she's like, could you make could you make a cranial nerve clock face for um and then all those all the physical therapy students can like <laughs> study it. And it's like that's really interesting, but oh, probably like not on my list of priorities. But that's pretty really funny they're doing that. Oh, I love it. I love it. Yeah, well, it's it's cool just to see. Um, I hope it's encouraging for you, but just your work is really having an impact, and, and just your presence in the Facebook group has been super encouraging to me and you're just such a valuable resource. I mean, if anyone is in that Facebook group, any of the listeners, you know, if you ask a question, Meg is likely going to respond with some type of resource or video that she did this exercise with this patient, uh, but just always, you know, really encouraging. So it's, uh, it's been just such a pleasure, you know, to have you around and, and your work is, you know, impacting a lot of people. Well, thanks for creating such a fantastic group. Cause like for me, it's like you guys are my you guys are my colleagues because I work I'm a sole practitioner you know even though there's another physio in my practice who does casual work for me it's not we don't see each other you know during the day so it's awesome to have that sounding board for me to have people to talk to I'm clearly a talkative person so (laughs) you know can you tell so yeah, it's, I just love, when I found Senior Rehab Project I was like yep I'm home this is good this is so nice (laughs) yeah it's it's been helpful for me. I know that. Um, yeah, there's so many people like like you and me that are kind of on the island, and yeah. you know our our profession. If Literally. we if we don't have some <laughs> sense of community, uh, I mean, I'd, I've only been out of school for six years, and just yeah. so much that I learned in school is already considered uh, out of date. 
or not yeah. accurate or correct. Yeah. I'm just saying if I didn't have something like this, this constant interaction with people, um, man, I would, yeah, I would not be anywhere near in terms of on, on top of my game than what I, I feel like uh, I would be. So it's, yeah, it's been pretty cool. Yeah, it's I, like it. I, I think it's fantastic. All the evidence-based um, resources that people share, like it's hard to even keep keep up with it all. I know. Um, <laughs> I do my best. Like I actually reckon I get better professional development out of, you know, your your Facebook group, your podcast, and a couple of other podcasts that I listen to than from any like paid PD that I've done in the last few years, to be honest. You know, like I learn so much more from just interacting with researchers and clinicians on Twitter who – who share yeah. share stories and share share articles all the time. It's fantastic. Yeah, that's a game changer. We're living in a great age. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> I want to wrap things up though. Be respectful of your time and just ask you one one more question. So you're going to be at CSM, correct? Did you book that? Are you on the phone? Fin- no, Justin. I booked my flights. <laughs> I uh, haven't All yet right. booked. I've done that much. I've actually, that's not, I've kind of lied to you then. I've booked from Australia to LA and I haven't yet booked the other stretch, but it's going to happen. Like I'll, I'll, right. I'll get there. <laughs> I I'm haven't sure you could yet re- decided if I'm going to do an exhibit or mm-hmm. um, be a, like a, a participant because I learned at World Physio Conference in Africa that I could not be both as much as yeah. I would have liked to have been. I paid for a pass to attend the conference and I couldn't, like I got to like two half sessions. That was it. So, mm-hmm. yeah, I haven't decided yet if I'm willing to put myself through that and be an exhibitor and exhibit clock yourself and balance yourself. I don't know. I haven't. Yeah. We could do like <laughs> a, you anyway. a like, I'll totally event in like the, the, the big lobby going into the exhibit hall. We could just like throw down a clock face and just get a big group of people. <laughs> like a clock yourself challenge like a flash mob <laughs> clock yourself right, flash right. mob organized <laughs> through senior rehab project <laughs> the, yeah, the security the would know what was coming <laughs> I know. we'll have to make something happen but so let's yeah. say you're at csm and there's this big talk all the geriatric rehab clinicians are, are in the room and you get up on stage and you have their attention you know for 30 seconds to a minute if you had that platform what would you want those people to know Wow, 30 seconds to a minute. I would want them to know that, uh, well, like we said before, that cognitive processing and speed is trainable and that we need to, to be tapping into it more than we're currently doing. I want them to know that um, that strength training is super important throughout the entire lifespan, including with older adults, and we need to be dosing more appropriately, but that we also need to be paying attention to um, the vulnerability of the pelvic floor um, I, you know, I, I, I get on my high horse about that and I, I go on about it quite a bit in the group that I think we really need to be doing more to assess, um, the pelvic floor and risk of prolapse with women, particularly before we start adding, um, heavy weights and, and, and serious weight training. Um, and, uh, I think I'd probably also appeal to them to say, let's, Let's do more to work out who's going to respond to our interventions. Let's stop trying to save every single person, as, as altruistic as that is, and it's in me and it's in you, to, to, to know that you can get the best out of everybody. But um, I think we probably need to invest in those people who are ready on that on that readiness to change journey, to actually engage in in physical exercise and engage in prehabilitation or rehabilitation rather than sharing our time and dividing it up amongst so many people who are not really um, going to respond to it and going to going to follow through with it. Um, that's yeah. something that I think we need to be doing better. Yeah, my gosh. That's <laughs> from, uh, from my case, so that, that's a lot of people. Um, yeah, that's good stuff, Meg. And I, yeah, I would agree with you that we do need to better identify people because um, we really don't have a way of doing that right now. No, we don't. I don't think we have anywhere near the right screening tools yet. Um, I don't think we've got good screening tools for cognition yet, Dustin. I don't think we've got good screening tools for um, for, for, for pre-dementia or for, for um, all of these sort of earlier balanced um impairments that we're seeing in in 
baby boomers and pre fallers, and if we can't if we can't even identify those people, then we're always going to be working downstream. We're always going to be fishing people out of the river and yeah. and rehabilitating these fractured knots rather than finding them earlier on, identifying slow cognitive processing speed, identifying um, balance imp- you know mild balance imp- impairments early on and, and rectifying them. Um, mm-hmm. At the moment, like I even find it hard to find the right outcome measures to use to prove that these people um, need, you know, need an intervention. Um, I think Ken Ken Miller's talking about that quite a, quite a bit at the moment, isn't he? Trying to find an outcome measure that we can use to identify people ahead of the game, upstream, so that they don't decline. Um, right instead of just keep on picking them up after they fall and then starting a balance intervention then or a stepping strategy intervention then. Hmm. Right. So, yeah, so, that would be yeah. my main thing. <laughs> All right. I love it. I love it. All right. So people look out for the clock yourself flash mob at CSM this year. <laughs> Meg, uh, give us your, all your websites and where people can find you on, on the interwebs. Yeah, sure. Um, www clockyourself.physio so p-h-y-s-i-o um and www.balanceyourself.physio it's also that book that i think saying that i authored it might be a bit of a stretch it's sort of just a, an exercise book it's a series of exercise progressions for better balance um with some you know some education in there it's hardly a novel but um you can preview you can preview all the education on balanceyourself.physio and you can preview the bronze level of the balance yourself book there um and then and you can order it online um so yeah and you can also catch me on twitter i'm meg lowry pt that's m-e-g-l-o-w-r-y and I'm on LinkedIn as well under Meg Lowry. I'm on, I'm active on a lot of social media platforms. Hey, it's um, <laughs> but it's, it probably looks like I'm on online all day, Justin. But I'm not. It's just every, <laughs> for every. It's very patient. concentrated. Yeah, it's true. Yeah. It's like well, before every patient, I'm online for like a couple of minutes because I like to arrive early. Like mm-hmm. you know, I set my own schedule so I arrive early, and I use Google Maps to get to their house, and then I've got five minutes before my appointment time, so I check in. And I check into senior yeah. rehab project. I check into Twitter, or, you know, just and like and yeah, share and going on. write a write however sixty characters or whatever it is post, and then it probably looks <laughs> like I'm sitting at home all day. <laughs> <laughs> no, not at all. No, I I know. Rolling senior no rehab one project. is thinking that. Yeah, they know you're busy. <laughs> well, good stuff, Meg. I appreciate your time and your work. Uh, people, check out all the links uh, that she mentioned. They'll be in the show notes as well. But some really. Uh, this awesome material that you can implement with your patients, regardless of your setting. So I uh, highly recommend checking that out and then uh, interacting with Meg in the, in the Facebook group is always encouraged as well. So Meg, appreciate your time. Thank you. Thanks so much. I can't wait to see you in New Orleans that much. I know for sure that I will see you. Yes. <laughs> yes. Hit me. Thank you for listening to the senior rehab podcast. If you only listen to these podcast episodes, You are missing out on 90% of the Senior Rehab Project. Hop on over to SeniorRehabProject.com where you can join the movement that's advancing care for older adults. You can join for free or become a part of the Game Changers where you can get some free gear and access to our monthly meetup. Just go to SeniorRehabProject.com. I appreciate y'all and I'll talk with you soon. But in the meantime, do not forget to stay funky.